in uh, Ephesians chapter 2, it's very familiar to all of you. We all know it. Uh, Paul says, beginning verse 8, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which uh, God uh, foreordained that we should walk in them. A very simple thing here. Paul says, by grace are ye saved through faith. And you know, a lot of the Calvinistic world and faith only folks and grace only folks, they'll say, well, we're saved by grace only. We're saved by faith only. And uh, even uh, some of them don't realize their own uh, <laughs> stupid contradictions say we're saved by grace only through faith only. Well, if you're saved by grace only, faith only has nothing to do with it. And if you're saved by faith only, grace only has nothing to do with it. <laughs> only means only. But uh, Paul here joins those two components of our salvation together. Those two components are grace and faith. God's grace is available for all mankind. That's what he wrote, uh, Paul wrote in Titus 2, 11 and 12. He said, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. So the grace of God has appeared to all men. And so I don't know where the universalist gets his idea. It may be from that passage. They say, well, all men are going to be saved. Nobody's going to be lost. Well, just because the grace of God has appeared to all men does not guarantee that all men will be saved. And we know that not all will be saved because Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So one may uh, recognize that Jesus is the Lord and still be lost if he doesn't do the Lord's will. Man cannot be saved by grace alone. If then man cannot be saved by grace alone, that means it takes something else. And that something else that it takes is faith. Now, Paul actually lists in Ephesians 2 the two sides. I said two components. I guess you could call them that. Uh, or the two sides of salvation. If we had a, a board up here where we could draw a line down the middle, then over here on this side we could write God's name. And over here we'd put man. And under God we would put grace. And under man, we would put faith. Those are the two components. On God's part, it's grace. Our salvation is by grace on the part of God. We didn't earn it. He was not obligated to give us anything. You cannot obligate God to save you. It's a matter of His glorious, magnificent grace that He reached down in mercy to save us. So salvation stems from God's grace. But on the part of man, man must do something. But let's look now at God's side over here, God's grace. It's defined as unmerited favor. Man could not save himself. It was, uh, in fact, it was impossible for man to save himself. Man could not and do, uh, uh, do anything to earn the favor of God. It was an impossibility. Now, since man couldn't do anything to earn his salvation or to obligate God to him, then it was necessary for, if we're to be saved, for God to do what we could not do for ourselves. And I think one of the grandest passages in the New Testament is found in Romans chapter 5 beginning in verse 6 where Paul and reading through verse 8 Romans 5 6 through 8 
where Paul writes, for when we were yet without strength, that is, we had no ability to save ourselves. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Those five words. That's you and me. That's the whole world. And Christ, the blessed and perfect and sinless and pure Son of God, died for me. He died so that I might not have to die eternally. He died that I might live eternally. Now look at what Paul says in verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. I mean, it's doubtful that anybody would look down and say, well, now there's a good man. I would die for him. Yet, peradventure, maybe, maybe, for a good man, some would even dare to die. It's possible. Then probably not. But listen to this. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is one of the grandest statements in all of the Bible. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. The perfect sacrifice for sin was the innocent blood, blood unstained by sin. And that was provided by the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Hebrews 9, the writer said, without the shedding of blood is no remission of sin. We could not have our sins remitted without the shedding of blood. And the blood of bulls and goats, we are told in that chapter, could not take away sin. It took the precious, pure, innocent blood of Jesus Christ. God's grace provided that perfect sacrifice. God's grace on God's part of salvation provided the refuge from sin, that sphere in which he has placed salvation. He says, salvation is here. Now come and get it. Here is salvation. Here's where you must be. And where he has provided salvation is in the body of Christ, which is the church. In Ephesians 1, and 23, Paul wrote, gave him to be the head, Christ, over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That church was in God's eternal purpose, and it is in the church, in Christ. Because to be in Christ is to be in his body, to be in his body is to be in Christ, to be in Christ is to be in the church, which is his body. And so in there, there's the sphere of salvation. God provided that. Now, that means anyone outside of Christ is not saved. But if you're in Christ, you're saved. And all spiritual blessings, Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, 3, are found in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The spiritual blessings are in Christ. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. And in Ephesians 1, he begins to enumerate those. After saying in verse 3 they were all in Christ, he said we're chosen. We're God's chosen people in Christ. Verse 4. According as he has chosen us in him. We are the children of God in Jesus Christ. We're adopted children of God. According to verse 5. In Christ. Now, now understand that these things we're enumerating are all in Christ. None of them out of him. So to be Chosen is to be in Christ. To be God's child is to be in Christ. To be accepted in whom he hath made us accepted in the beloved, verse 6, to be accepted with God, we must be in Christ. In verse 7, we are redeemed by his blood. Anyone who is not in Christ is not redeemed by his blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1, 7. And then he says, all things are in Christ in verse 10. And our inheritance, our eternal inheritance is in him. Those great spiritual blessings. God provided those. That's what his grace did. That's what his grace does. So God has provided this feast. He provided the, uh, he favored us to the extent that he provided the sacrifice for our sins. When Abraham was told to offer his son Isaac in Genesis 22, Isaac said, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. He said, here is the wood and here is the fire, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And they were up on Mount Moriah. And Abraham said, son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Abraham probably didn't recognize at the time, but he was looking down the corridors of time to Calvary. And Christ would die for our sins. God provided his own lamb. Under the old covenant, men chose the lamb from their flocks to offer to God. Under the new covenant, God chose the lamb to offer for our sins. And that lamb is his only begotten son. What a great offering. He chose that. God chose to do that. And then he said, in my son, in his body, which is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, I'm placing all these spiritual blessings. If you want to partake of them, enter my son. Here they are. So there's God's side. But look at the other side. Over here is man's side. God's done everything he's going to do. He's not going to do anything else. God willed our salvation. He, he's the great architect, the designer of it. He designed it. It was in his eternal purpose. That's what Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians. God is the great designer. Christ purchased it with his own blood. The Holy Spirit revealed it through inspired men. Neither the Father, the Son, nor the Holy Spirit are going to do anything else. They've done everything they're going to do. There's God's side. Now, here's man's side. God has provided the feast. Man has to come to the feast. Grace is what God has done for us. Faith is what man must do to appropriate that salvation by grace. Faith is defined. In Romans 10, 17, we're told, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith is engendered by the word of God. And hearing there doesn't mean just hearing the sound of it. It means understanding it. Letting it sink into the brain and uh, uh, considering it there. Assessing the information of the gospel there. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Do you want to know what faith really is? There is one chapter in the Bible that's filled with illustrations of what faith really is. That's the 11th chapter of Hebrews. By faith, we are told in Hebrews 11, 4, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Abel offered. That's what it said. By faith, Abel offered. By faith, Enoch walked with God. We are told in Ephesians, or I'm, I'm sorry, in Hebrews 11, 5. By faith, Hebrews 11, 7 says, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah did what? He was warned of God and moved with fear and prepared an ark. Warned of God, God told him what to do. In Genesis 6, God said, Noah, I'm going to destroy the earth. You make an ark and here are the specifications and you make it according to this. And at the end of that chapter, in chapter 6, 22 in Genesis, it says, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. He built that ark to the specifications that God gave him. God's part in Noah's salvation was grace. In fact, in Genesis 6, it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord, 
God's grace reached down and said, Noah, build an ark. And Noah's faith built, uh, reached up in the building of that ark and grasped the grace of God. And that's what it means when we talk about faith. Faith is, as we were told in preaching school, one of our teachers said, boys, in studying the 11th chapter of Hebrews, faith is doing what God said because God said to do it. Now that's what faith is. Faith isn't saying, I believe God is in heaven. I believe Jesus Christ is his son. That's not faith. That's not Bible faith. Faith is obeying. Faith is doing. Faith reaches up. The grace of God reaches down. God did that. He reached down to man. But man has to reach up to God in faith. And that means obedient faith. Abraham, Hebrews 11, 8, when he was called to go out into a country which he should have to receive for an inheritance, went out, not knowing whither he went. God said, Abraham, you leave her of the Chaldees. I'll take you to a land. I'll show you a land that I'll give to you and your descendants. And Abraham went out. By faith, Abraham went out. What did Abraham do? He heard God and obeyed God. God's grace was extended to Abraham, and Abraham's faith responded to that grace. Same thing that man must, be, man must do today. Saving faith results from teaching. Jesus said that in John 6, 44 and 45. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. Someone says, ah, oh, God has to draw us. Yes, God draws us, but how? Well, he answers that in the very next verse. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. That's how God draws us to Christ. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Every, every man, therefore, Jesus said, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. That's how we're drawn. Very simple. God's grace reaches down and we're drawn to Him through teaching. Faith is the first step in salvation. And it's a work of God. John 6. People said to Jesus, said, what can we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe on Him whom He has sent. Faith is a work. Faith only won't save. James said that in James chapter 4. He said, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Methodist discipline in article 9 says, wherefore that we are justified by faith only is the most wholesome doctrine, very full of comfort. Well, it may be very full of comfort, but it's not a most wholesome doctrine. It's false doctrine. Because James says, the only, other pla the only place in the Bible where it speaks of faith only is in James where he says, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. So faith is the first step. It's a must for man. Hebrews 11, 6. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Second step of salvation on man's part. God's already done his now, remember. And the Holy Spirit has revealed all this. Now the second step on man's part is repentance. After man believes, he must repent of his sin. Luke 13, 3 is what Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all in like manner perish. Well, what is repentance? Jesus illustrated that in the parable of the two sons over in uh, the book of Matthew chapter 21, ver uh, beginning verse 28. Jesus is not talking about repentance there, but he illustrates what repentance is in this parable. There was a man who had two sons. He told his first and said, go work today in my vineyard. And he said, I will not. But afterward, he repented and went. Now that illustrates what repentance is. What did he say? I will not. But he later went. What stood between him and winning or going? He changed his mind. That's all he did. He said, I will not. And then he changed his mind to will, and he went. That's what repentance is. It's a change of the mind. 
I always tell people I don't know what his incentive was to change his mind, but I know what it would have been if I had told my dad I will not. He would have given me a great incentive to repent, and I would have. But that's what repentance is. It's simply a change of the mind or the will. It is preceded by godly sorrow. Paul said godly sorrow worketh repentance, 2 Corinthians 7, 10. And it's followed by a change of life. So a change of life is not repentance. It is a result of repentance. Godly sorrow is not repentance. It is what causes one to repent. Repentance is simply a change of the mind or a change of the will. And then that third step over here on man's side is confession. Confession of what? Well, same thing Peter confessed in Matthew 16, 16. Jesus said, whom, whom say ye that I am? Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The same thing that's illustrated for us in the 8th chapter of Acts, verse 37, when the uh, uh, eunuch is riding along in his chariot, he is uh, intercepted by Philip, whom he asked to get into the chariot, and Philip preaches Christ to him. They go on their way uh, as he's preaching Christ. The very next verse says, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's the confession. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Whosoever will confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. That confession must be an oral confession. It must be made before men. That means with men or human beings as witnesses. And that's what the eunuch did. He said, he confessed, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He didn't confess, I've had an experience and I believe God's forgiven me, or uh, God, for Christ's sake, has uh, forgiven my sins, or I got this great feeling and I'm testifying. He didn't say anything like that. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Same confession the eunuch made is what's required of men today. Same one. Then that final step towards salvation over here on man's part that puts man into Christ is baptism. You don't believe into Christ. You don't confess into Christ. You don't repent into Christ. You are baptized into Christ. And by the way, you think about this. The denominational world says, oh, we're not saved by works. Baptism is a work. Baptism is a work, but whose work? When you were baptized, was that your work? I submitted to it. Amen. We don't, when I was baptized, I didn't do anything. They baptized me. When you were baptized, you didn't do anything. They, somebody else baptized you. That wasn't work on your part. They don't have any idea what they're talking about when they say it's a work. It's not a work. But we are baptized into Christ, and that's why the devil makes his last stand at baptism. He don't care if you want to believe, repent, or confess. He doesn't care. A lot of good people who are on the road to hell. A lot of people believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God on the road to hell. A lot of people say, I believe it. They'll confess it. A lot of people live good moral lives who are on the road to hell. The devil doesn't mind that. But once you're baptized, he knows that he loses a citizen of his kingdom and that act of baptism puts you into Christ's kingdom into his body what did we say at the first where are all spiritual blessings in Christ and that's what baptism does it puts you into Jesus Christ where all spiritual blessings are no the baptismal water does not cleanse us from sin we don't preach water salvation Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom, Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. His blood forgives our sins. But where? In Him. How do you get into Him? By being baptized. Baptism is the gateway into Christ. No other thing will put you into Christ. None of the things that man does 
on man's part of his that part of uh, salvation on man's part none of those things that he does however puts him into heaven not one he doesn't believe repent confess or even be baptized into heaven he is baptized into Christ and in John 14, 6, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the way that leads to heaven. We are baptized into him. It means we're baptized into the way that leads to heaven. And we must stay in that way. God's grace has provided that way. But God, uh, a man must remain faithful in order to go to heaven at last. Be thou faithful, John wrote, of Jesus' words in Revelation 2.10, unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. Jesus didn't say be faithful till you die. He said be faithful even if it brings about your death, and I'll give you a crown of life. Paul said in his last letter to Timothy, I'm now ready to be offered. I've finished my course. Fought a good fight. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Grace through faith, that's how we're saved. God's grace reached down. Now man's faith must reach up in obedience to the will of God. If you're subject to the gospel invitation in this hour to do those things we've been talking about, will you come while we stand and sing?